Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Wendy Cromash. I am delighted to see you today for today's Levy Lecture. We have the multi-talented Ava Thompson Greenwell um, with us for an hour to talk about her documentary, Mandela in Chicago, as well as her new book, Ladies Leading. And uh, without, Dr. Thompson Greenwell is a professor at Northwestern. She uh, is an experienced uh, television journalist um, and just an all around good person. So without any further ado, please speak to our, the Thank floor you. is yours. Thank you so much, Wendy, and thank you so much to all the people who have joined us today. I see our numbers up in, uh, looks like 64, which is great. It's so good to see everybody, although technically I can't see you. I'm going to share my screen, and hopefully you've had a chance to already see the documentary, but if you haven't, I'm going to share with you uh, the trailer just to kind of uh, jar your memory, and if you haven't seen it, it's a tease so that you will actually go and see it. It is available on WTTW's website. If you just Google WTTW and then the words Mandela in Chicago, you will find it there. So I wanted to give you a little bit of background about uh, South Africa. Some of you may already have this information. You may already know this, uh, so just indulge me for a minute. This is the South African flag. If you notice the various colors, black, green, gold for the African National Congress and red, white, and blue for the Dutch. So apartheid officially ended of course in 1994 when black South Africans were given the right to vote for the first time. And so we know that uh, while strict racial segregation um, had been going on in South Africa since the mid 1600s, uh, going back and forth between the Dutch colonization and British colonization. It's really the Dutch who had the greatest influence in South Africa and still do today. So apartheid um, became officially sanctioned by the nas white nationalist government in 1948 by the Afrikaners who were descendants of the Dutch. And their language, Afrikaans, is one of 11 official languages in South Africa, along with English from the British and nine other African languages such as Zulu and Kosa. Um, if you watch the Black Panther movie, you know that T'Challa speaks Kosa and, his, and he speaks that language in the movie with his father. Today alone, 19 million people speak Kosa in the world, including in Zimbabwe. So that's just a little bit of uh, background information for you there about the flag and just the history of colonization in the country. Uh, Winnie, Madi, Madiki Zela Mandela, who was Nelson Mandela's second wife. I bring her up because um, the, Nas the white nationalist government in South Africa copied a lot from the United States. And as you heard in the documentary, one of the participants said, you know, I grew up uh, experiencing Jim Crow. And so what was happening in South Africa wasn't very different than what I had actually experienced. So some of these racial segregation laws in South Africa were extremely strict. And the reason they had to be stricter was because of the mirror opposite population in South Africa. That is 80% of the population was and is black. And so uh, in order to control those people, you had to make sure that your laws were extremely rigid. So, um, one of the comments that uh, Winnie Mandela made in 2011, or 2010 rather, when she uh, visited uh, Alabama in uh, recognition of the anniversary of Bloody Sunday um, was that Birmingham has always been an extension of our struggle. I was stunned by the similarities of the methods of oppression. The apartheid regime must have come here to take notes, which I thought was, you know, so, um, right on point. Uh, one of the things that South Africa did was it banned interracial marriage. And as you know, here in the United States, interracial marriage was also banned. Um, so that's why, if you know this comedian, Trevor Noah, uh, many of you know him as a comedian, but he also wrote a book called Born a Crime. He is a South African who is whose mother is Black and his father is white. And by the way, his book is a great read. So uh, obviously being a comedian, he has a little humor there. 
but he uses this humor for a very, very serious topic. So if you haven't had a chance to read it, um, it's, it's quite uh, funny, but also quite informative. So as you know, from the documentary, Nelson Mandela was released from prison in 1990 after spending 27 years, mainly on Robben Island, convicted of treason. And once he was released, of course, he traveled all over the world, particularly all over the United States. I remember when I was a news reporter in 19, oh, I think it was 1992 in Tampa, Florida, I was given the assignment to travel from Tampa to Atlanta, where he was gonna be speaking in that major stadium there. Um, of course, he didn't come to Chicago in 1990, as you discovered in the documentary, discovered why he didn't come. So there's a tease there. But he did end up going to cities like Atlanta, um, New York, Chicago. And again, the primary goal was certainly to thank the people, but also to raise money for the ANC. They knew that there, there was an election that was coming up and it was important to get uh, as much money as possible for that election. Just I want to situate you geographically, 8,683 miles from Chicago. That's how far Johannesburg is from the city of Chicago. Um, I have traveled there, uh, I think it's 11 times now, um, after several 19-hour trips through uh, my position as a co-director of the South African Journalism and Residency Program, uh, where students get a chance to work as junior reporters. I've had a chance to travel there numerous times. And so as I was going back and forth to South Africa and also teaching a course, a prep course to get the students ready to go there and work as journalists, um, I realized um, there were so many people in Chicago who had had uh, a relationship with the anti-apartheid movement. And as I talked to one person, they would lead me to other people and they would lead me to other people. And before I knew it, I said to myself, I have got to do something to document all the work that Chicagoans have done in the anti-apartheid movement. And as I was thinking about that, I was also thinking about the fact that these people were aging. Um, they were you know, in their 70s and 80s uh, by the time we started doing some of the interviews. And I knew that they would not be around forever. And it was so important for them to be able to tell their own story. So here's the trailer. Um, again, if you haven't seen it, this is a tease. If you have, hopefully this will jar your memory about some questions you might want to ask as it relates to the doc. Harold Rogers. My name is Joan Gehrig. My name is Prexy Nesbitt from Chicago, Illinois, from the West Side. Well, I'm Mike Saviway Elliott. I am Dr. Iva Carruthers. My name is Carol Mosley Braun. I grew up on the South Side of Chicago. There was a time when I filmed Nelson Mandela. It's called uh, Labor Welcomes Mandela to Chicago. I first heard about apartheid when I was in Nigeria. And so I learned about South Africa as a child, really. Free South Africa! Comrades, I bring you the greetings of the African National Congress. There was no question we had to bring him to Chicago because in 1990, he hadn't come to Chicago. Ninety-three, recognizing that absence, he made this trip and it's very important. This is a great day for our city. Job is partially done, but it isn't finished yet. And he gave this incredible speech. You have been the source of strength. He was like a like a teacher, and we were all like in his classroom. Okay, um, as you could see, even from that uh, trailer there, uh, one of the things that really was important to me was to allow people, as I said earlier, 
to speak their truth and to talk about their experience during the anti-apartheid movement. Mike Elliott, who you saw there, passed away about a month ago. He actually was able to see the documentary before he passed uh, since it premiered on WTTW in February. So I was really happy that he was able to see it. You know, um, you saw at the end of the documentary, there were two other people, Ora Shu and Conrad Worrell, who had passed away uh, in between the time that I had completed the documentary and it airing. And then I learned also that another participant in the documentary, Ed Buzz Palmer, who was the husband of um, the Palmer, who I'm drawing a blank on her first name now, but she was a state senator. Um, and I learned that, you know, via the news. So again, I knew the urgency of getting this story out there. And I think the fact that uh, four people in the documentary um, have passed since I started working on this speaks to the urgency of now. Uh, Lindy Way Mabusa was one of the persons I was able to interview in her home. So this is her when she was coming to Operation Push in Chicago. And this is uh, Lindy Way Mabusa uh, when we interviewed her in her home uh, outside of Pretoria. Um, as you can see, she's still a very jazzy lady, uh, but she had a lot to say about her experience in the United States, really as the official spokesperson of the ANC, she was based out of Washington. You know, she was living here in the United States, basically in exile, but after the fall of apartheid, of course, she went back to South Africa and actually became an ambassador to Germany and held other diplomatic positions within the ANC government. And, and by the way, she was among the first women in the ANC to hold such high positions. The other person I wanted to point out was Moses Mai Kiso, who was also an anti-apartheid activist politician. Again, you saw him in his younger days and then we interviewed him. Actually, um, I think it was either a week after election day, I was there in May. He had started his own party called the Democratic, the African Democratic Change Political Party. Uh, and I think that speaks to the issue of some disenchantment with the ANC that some of these former stalwarts of the ANC have now started their own parties because the ANC has not uh, been able to deliver on some of the promises of 1994. And so there's a lot of a feeling of urgency in South Africa about the change that still hasn't occurred. Obviously there's a lot more political power that blacks wield in South Africa, but there's still the economic piece that has yet to be addressed. And I think you saw some of that at the end of the documentary. Um, these former Chicagoans, the Petersons, who I interviewed in their home in uh, South Africa, uh, who lived in Chicago for a period of time. Uh, and you heard from their daughter, Karen, who talked about her experience being in a predominantly black school on the South Side in the Hyde Park neighborhood. They are well and have also had a chance to watch the documentary and they speak very highly, still have really very positive relationships with uh, the folks that they met in Chicago. And the beauty about Zoom now is that it allows us to stay in contact no matter where we are in the world. Um, this is uh, some photos of present day South Africa. I wanted to juxtapose them but uh, as well, meaning um, South Africa has one of the highest what we call Gini coefficients. That means that there's dramatic um, wealth, but also dramatic poverty. The disparity between the two um, just really sits with me every time I go. So we have uh, the Nelson Mandela Children's Hospital, which uh, at this time, when this photo was taken a couple of years ago, I think it was still being built. It hadn't opened, but the last time I was there in 2019, it was open. And that was in February, I'm sorry, February, actually of 20, February of 2020, actually we made it back just before the pandemic uh, hit and shut everything down. This is a skyline of the city of Johannesburg. Um, it's known as City of Trees. That's kind of familiar, right? Being in, uh, being, being in Evanston. But you can see beautiful skyline. Uh, there are areas where there's cranes, uh, you know, buildings are going up. There's an area called Santon, which is uh, very well known as considered the, the business district of Johannesburg and a lot of wealth resides there. Commercialization, um, they don't have a lot of uh, McDonald's and some of those chain restaurants, but KFC actually is quite big there. And this is one of the malls uh, called Red Bank, which is across uh, the street from where we stayed. And you can see that um, there is a lot of commerce there. It's just that 
it's cloistered in certain parts of the city and the country. Um, but then there's still a lot of this, a lot of poverty. There's still lots of people who don't have um, bathrooms and they have to go to someplace like this when they need to go out. Uh, running water, and you can see here, um, this is where they come to actually get their water. And so there's still a lot of poverty, um, overwhelmingly black poverty in South Africa. Uh, Robin Island, again, you saw some of this. Again, this is where Nelson Mandela um, was in prison. This of course is a major tourist spot now in South Africa, if, you've, if you ever go there, uh, which is um, outside of Cape Town, uh, make sure you go to Robin Island. Uh, they used to make sure that um, all the tour guides were themselves former prisoners in Robin Island. But as you can imagine, as time goes on, that gets harder to do. One of the biggest issues for South Africa today is poverty and also the electrical grid. So when we were there in uh, February of 2019, and this still continues to be an issue on Valentine's Day, this is what we experienced. Five, six hours a day. Yeah, no, it's not. I went to the store about two days ago to go and buy LED lights to have in my home. So we had dinner by candlelight, not because we wanted to, but because the electrical grid is consistently failing. Uh, there's been co corruption within the system. Um, it's not um, strong enough to withstand the demand. And so now there's an app. Um, if you want to know when the lights are going out in your area, when the electricity will be available, you actually put in your zip code and then that helps you sort of plan your day. You can imagine how during certain times of the year, if it goes out a lot, if you're a small business person, it really makes it difficult for you to conduct business and be as effective as possible. The other thing that I wanted to share with you is education. Education continues to be very important, but as Trevor Noah talks about in his book, uh, some kids go to private school, they have A schools, B schools, and C schools, and that really um, means the quality of the school. This was um, uh, Niiko Primary School in Tembisa, which is in Gauteng province, which is near Johannesburg. Um, this teacher here had a good 40 something students in the class. I know uh, in the Evanston area, you know, the average is probably about 23. So you can imagine, and, and no assistant in the classroom, how difficult it is. You see some of the kids often, again, two to a desk, um, and it was pretty tight in there. So from an education standpoint, this is one of the issues that uh, South Africa is still having to grapple with. Um, there are some rays of hope. This was what we might call a uh, charter school. Um, it's Chartwell Entrepreneurship School. It's a private slash public. They get a lot of donations and their focus is really on entrepreneurship. The principal at this particular school felt that entrepreneurship was the way out of economic inequality in South Africa. And he felt as though if he began teaching children at this age, the importance of entrepreneurship, that that would raise up a whole new generation of entrepreneurs who could then start companies, employ people, and use technology in a positive way. There are after-school programs. This was in Cape Town. And if you know anything about the racial makeup of South Africa, uh, Cape Town in particular has a large colored population. This is an aunt and niece. They almost look like twins, right? But um, aunt, this is the aunt, and this is her niece. And they both worked in this after-school program in Cape Town. Um, again, uh, the goal being to improve education as much as possible so that students can feel that they have more opportunities to go to the university, but also to be entrepreneurs and learn as much as possible. And then this was also a unique school, Mola Malaba School in Kailicha, Cape Town. Uh, this was an all girls school. And so you can see them in their kindergarten classroom. And this was a fifth grade class, much smaller. Uh, class uh, sizes. I think these eighth graders, one, two, three, four, five, I think there were only six girls 
um, in the eighth grade class. Um, and then of course, obviously you had more in kindergarten because the school had only been open for uh, a brief while. But um, I, I, this is gonna be my last slide so that we can open up for questions for the next um, 10 minutes or so, and then we'll move on to the book. 5.59%, um, this is the COVID vaccine rate per 100 people in South Africa. So I don't know uh, when we will be able to go back there, uh, only because um, our students obviously have been on hiatus this last 15 months. Our hope was that we'd be able to take students back uh, next year, but we know that that's probably not going to happen. So we're looking at 2023 probably. So when we think about the vaccination rate um, here in the United States compared to there, there is a huge, huge difference. So I wanted to uh, stop there so that I could answer any questions that you might have about the documentary. One of the things that typically, uh, things that do come up in the Q&A section is about how much time it takes to put together a documentary, the money, uh, the connections, the stamina, the patience, the partnerships, all those things. So Wendy, I'm gonna stop there. And if there are questions, it looks like there might be some questions in the chat. I saw some of those come up and um, we can take those for a little bit and then transition over to ladies leading. Um, okay, actually there are no questions right at this minute, but um, right. you, uh, when you show the picture of the aunt and the niece, you yeah. refer to them as colored. And yeah. can you remind me or remind the audience um, what that term signifies? Yes, so in South Africa, they have um, specific designations of race, black, white, colored. So coloreds are typically people who are mixed race uh, people. And um, that's what I was demonstrating there. Cape Town tends to have a larger mixed race population than Johannesburg. And so when you go the, to the two main cities that most people have heard of, you'll see a real difference in just the people walking on the street in Cape Town versus in, in Johannesburg. Johannesburg tends to be a little bit more um, of a black centered uh, city than Cape Town. Okay, and does, isn't it the government's responsibility to provide running water to residents? Yeah, well, you, you would think so, but I'll tell you that um, delivery of services, which is a common term that's used in South Africa, is a constant, constant battle. Um, usually when my students go there and start reporting, some of the first sto stories that they cover are stories about the lack of delivery of services, meaning, you know, water, electricity, all those kinds of things. And so they've been working on it. And there are people who are trying to do their best. But as you can see, there is still a lot of work to be done. I think um, Cheryl, who's in the documentary, uh, who was one of the Northwestern students who became involved in the anti-apartheid uh, movement, Cheryl Odom said it best. And we have to remember that South Africa has been at this thing of democracy only since 1994, not quite 30 years. And so while our expectations are certainly a high that things will ha would have improved beyond what they are, I think we do have to keep it in perspective. As she said, we are still dealing with inequity here in the United States. And I think the Black Lives Matter movement and the constant stories we see about um, inequality in housing and policing and education in jobs here in the United States, in some ways, you know, it, South Africa is mirroring those same things, but they have been at it for a much shorter time than the U.S. has been. So in some ways, the progress that they have made is remarkable, but that doesn't mean they need to stop there. There's still a lot of work to be done. Okay. And the Nelson Mandela Pediatric Hospital, is that um, available to any child who needs it? Yes, I believe so. And I believe they wanted to make sure, I think they received lots of donations to make sure that this was a hospital that was a public hospital, that any child, regardless of income, would be able to go there. Okay. Uh, Jennifer would like to know, did you get to meet, meet did you get to meet Nelson Mandela? No, I did not. Um, when I covered the story in, when he was in Atlanta, um, I could not get close enough 
Um, and so I never had a chance to meet him. The close I got was the closest that I got was to actually go to his foundation. And I've never met any of his family members either. Unfortunately, one of his daughters, Zimzi, um, died suddenly last year and she was only in her 50s. So um, there's been a lot of tragedy, you know, within his family. Um, and so unfortunately, no, I never had a chance to meet him or any of the family members. Okay. Um, Margareta is asking about Gracie Mitchell Mandela. Um, is, I, I'm not familiar with that name. Is that his second wife or? Oh, a Gracia, I think. Gracia? Gracia, yes. Um, so I believe she is still living. As you know, um, he and Winnie Mandela split. Um, you know, I, I would say I'm not exactly sure of the year. Um, you can look it up, but Gracia Michelle Mandela is his third wife. And um, if you were to see any of the more recent photos, you would see her by his side. He was uh, married before um, he went, he met uh, Winnie Mandela. So a lot of people don't know that. They think that Winnie Mandela was his first wife, but she was actually his second wife. Okay. Uh, is it still considered a crime to be mixed race? Oh, no. No longer considered to be a crime. Uh, okay. Uh, Denise would like to know, what are the promises the ANC has not been able to keep resulting well, in the new political parties? Well, I would think the biggest issue is the continued economic inequalities. Um, you know, when we were there in 2019, we visited a home that was just palatial. It was up on a hill. It was owned by a white family. I walked in and I thought I was in one of the fanciest homes in Hollywood. And then to go to some of the locations in Soweto and see the dramatic difference, you know, you, you have to leave there going, I'm troubled by that, right? And so the biggest challenge has really been bringing some of those basic services and housing. You know, there was an attempt to build houses, uh, I guess what we would call here in the United States, public housing more public housing for people so that they wouldn't have to live in houses built of metal and they would have running water and they would have toilets on the inside of those homes. But it has not been um, a situation that has been uh, well done. And so consequently, sometimes uh, you get people selling those houses because they need the immediate money as opposed to the house themselves. So jobs, that's another big issue. Our, some of our students covered uh, stories where they were trying to do job training and trying to bring more technology there for younger people. Uh, transportation is a problem. So often uh, people have to travel far distances to, to a job. And so a lot of their paycheck gets eaten up just getting there. Uh, and so it, it's these kinds of basic day-to-day -day kind of challenges that people are experiencing, particularly the what they call the born freeze. These are um, South Africans who were born after apartheid, so after 1994. They are much less um, willing to wait. And so consequently, I think this is why you have some of these new political parties that are forming. But in, in particular, um, the Economic Freedom Party, the EFF, which is founded by Julius Malema, who actually was a part of the, uh, he was a young ANC member. He broke off and formed his own party. And if you look up some of the SONA State of the Nation addresses uh, in South Africa, you can find them on YouTube. Uh, you will find that there is a lot of tension between uh, particularly the EFF because they're growing. The reason they're growing is people are becoming more and more disenchanted with the ANC. So during the last uh, national elections, uh, the ANC garnered, I think in the 60s percent of the vote versus in 1994, I think they got you know in the, the 90 percent. So you can see sort of the chipping away over time and people are becoming more and more um, disillusioned with the ANC. And, and the ANC recognizes that as well. You know, this is the party of Nelson Mandela. But remember, Nelson Mandela, um, since that time, there have been other presidents who have not been Nelson Mandela's in any form or fashion. They have, they've been corrupt in some cases. 
The current president, Cyril Ramaphosa, is trying to come back from, from that. But now we have COVID. And COVID certainly um, doesn't help matters for any country that is trying to, to dig itself out of um, economic uh, trouble. And it certainly doesn't help uh, South Africa because they were not at a point where they could say that we got anywhere near equity in terms of the um, economic lives of black people there. Is there a solar movement uh, in South Africa that would help the grid problem? Now that's a very good question. Uh, we've been there a couple of times and I rarely recall even seeing any solar. And I'm not sure why that is. It seems like it would be a good idea given the climate there. Um, now, keep in mind, though, that there, there are winter months there, and it does get cold. Cold is relative, though, to Chicago, right? I, I would say it gets cool, cold enough where you might need heat. But often, people who are living, again, in those communities where the homes are built out of um, metal, they don't, um, they don't have any heat, obviously. Or if they do have some electricity, it's rigged illegally meaning um, if they've had some deaths as a result of some of the, those electrical lines, those, li uh, have those lines have been live and maybe somebody touched it and didn't realize it. Um, the other thing as it relates to not having electricity is that in some of the communities, of course, when it gets darker early at night, they have to use kerosene lamps. I don't know how many of you uh, remember the days when um, your home, I know my grandmother used to talk about, we use the kerosene lamp. She was born in 1918. And so think about that in the 21st century in 2021, having to use a kerosene lamp to do your homework at night and the possibility that you could have accidents. So there are a lot of burn accidents uh, also in South Africa because some of the families are still having to use kerosene to light and you know to get some lighting in the evening. So, so it's, it's a real challenge. And I think sometimes people forget they've forgotten you know, they know Nelson Mandela and they know him as this um, huge figure of, you know, in helping to end apartheid. But I think you heard from Funeka Shishale in the documentary, and she actually lives on the south side of Chicago and still is very connected to the country because her sister lives there. And so she has a perspective of having lived in the United States for maybe 20, 30 years, but also traveling back to South Africa every year. And what she reminds us is that you know one man is not a movement, right? We tend to put all of that into one person, but the reality is there were lots of other people who were also helpful in eliminating apartheid, uh, but economic apartheid is still existing. And again, it's not just in South Africa. I would say it's, it, it's existing here in the United States as well. Are the townships still in existence? Yes, they are. And there are various townships. So Soweto, of course, is one of the townships. And what's interesting about Soweto is, again, Southwest Township, that's actually what it stands for, is, um, you know, Soweto was the site. It has a huge museum there. Um, and it is the site of one of the most major uprisings in South Africa in 1976, when the students were told, you're not going to be taught. We can't teach you in your own language. You have to be taught in the language of the oppressor. And that was a major uprising in 76 that led to really, you know, kind of the start of their civil rights movement. Um, the other thing that you heard in the documentary too from Tara Lakota, who also has formed his own political party, has abandoned the ANC, was that um, those in South Africa were also looking to civil rights folks in the United States. Uh, and, and wondering what it is they were doing to try to get away from this strict and rigid segregation. So I think often folks in the United States don't realize that other countries are also looking to you uh, to decide how they might go about their protests, how they might go about trying to bring more equity. And so that was, I think, a very powerful statement for him to make that we didn't realize also how much the United States was doing for our cause. And we are forever grateful for that. And I think that that's important for people to know as well is that if you are involved in any way in the um, anti-apartheid movement in the United States, whether it was in Chicago, whether it was wherever you're from, 
uh, it brings back some satisfaction to know that the work that you did actually had meaning and that he was actually released and that the country has the opportunity to make all these changes. Okay. Um, one last question before we um, move uh, to talk about your book. Um, why do you think either Richard Daly or someone from his administration would not uh, agree to comment? Comment, yeah. Well, um, I would say um, maybe it wasn't his finest hour because he obviously did come around in 1993 and a lot of the footage you see that actually comes from Mike Elliott, the one who talked about having um, videotaped Nelson Mandela's speech. Um, you know, I reached out as a journalist, you know, your goal is to get both sides of the story so that I can hear what he had to say about it. And I reached out to several people who either were his spokespersons at the time or were continuing to reach out to him and multiple times and never heard back. Um, I do know that I think he had suffered a stroke around the time that I was trying, I was still was experiencing some effects of the stroke. So it's possible that he just maybe decided he did not want to go on camera. You know, who knows, right? It's, it's a host of things. Uh, but my guess would be that maybe he just didn't want to talk about that, that part of um, what other people felt not giving adequate um, security to Nelson Mandela. I mean, you know, you have to remember that, you know, during the Reagan era, uh, Nelson Mandela was considered a terrorist. So let's not forget that one of the reasons he was in prison is because there was an effort to blow up the, interestingly, electrical uh, grids in South Africa. And that was their way of getting the white nationalist government's attention. And so it, it wasn't that Nelson Mandela and all the other people were completely innocent. I mean, I think that's the thing that we have to remember is sometimes we tend to want to, you know, whitewash, sanitize a person's background and say that they were perfect and they were this shining light. And obviously he was, but at the same time, one of the reasons that got him in prison was this um, charge of treason and sabotage on the part um, of the country. And so I think having that perspective might give people uh, a better understanding, a more, a fuller understanding of why he was in prison in the first place. And obviously any kind of action that might have been perceived as going against the national government, nationalist government was also perceived as illegal. You know, getting a group of people together to talk about how you're gonna fight against apartheid, no, that, that was not allowed. That was considered illegal. And so um, I think that context, you know, is so, so important. Um, Nelson Mandela also maintained uh, strong relationships with uh, Fidel Castro uh, in Cuba. And when he came to Chicago, that was one of the first questions that some of the reporters asked him is, well, what about your relationship with Cuba? And his response was, uh, Cuba has helped us in our toughest time, and we're not going to abandon Cuba just because the United States thinks we should. So I, I think those kinds of responses um, were not always the kind of responses that people thought they should hear from a Nelson Mandela. And so uh, you have to consider all of that, I think, when you consider his legacy. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, okay, let's switch gears. Uh, you recently completed uh, and published the book, Le Lady, Ladies Leading. Yes, Ladies Leading. So it's not Leading Ladies because Leading Ladies are in front of the camera. Let me tell you about that. Uh, but Ladies Leading are the people behind the camera. And so this book really came out of some dissertation research that I did starting in 2009. And what, what was important to me, and I'm gonna share with you a couple of slides, is um, this was a group that's behind the scenes, has lots of control over news content, but their numbers are small. And I was really curious about how they had experienced racism and sexism during their career. And so as I went to um, actually find these women, uh, the hardest part, of course, I don't know if you're able to uh, allow me to share screen again, uh, Wendy. Oh, there we go, yeah. 
And so the hardest part uh, actually was finding these women. So I'm going to be doing something for the author showcase. The book was selected to be featured in the 2021 uh, NABJ, that's the National Association of Black Journalists uh, Showcase. And actually, as soon as I get off of this call, I'm going to be getting on a Zoom uh, with Chanel Jones, who was a former student of mine. She is um, one of the co-hosts for the Today Show, the third hour. And she's going to be interviewing me about this uh, topic in the book. So here's my timeline. I started out in 2011. Um, dissertation was completed in 2014. This was the title of my dissertation. You know, dissertations have to be titled, um, it had to be complicated, right? So unseen yet heard, invisible power and gendered racism among black women television news managers in the US. Whew, that is a mouthful. But um, I say all that to say um, it's been 10 years in the making. So I started doing interviews in 2011, did the bulk of them in 2013, 2014, I think it was came back and did some follow-up interviews in 2019. And then in 2021, the book was um, ready for publication. So in the end, I was saying earlier that sometimes it's actually hard to find who these women are because number one, most of the surveys look at women or they look at Blacks. They don't look at Black women, the intersection of those two. So I had to find them through women I already knew. I had to find them through women they knew who said, oh, have you talked to so-and-so? And again, similar sort of pattern as it relates even to the documentary is that we call that the snowball effect when one person tells you to talk to this person and that person tells you to talk to somebody else. So out of the 100, 100 or so women that I contacted, 40 agreed to talk to me. Um, I also talked to the mentors, some of the mentors of the women who were interviewed and some of their mentees to get a more well-rounded perspective I decided to keep all the names anonymous. And the reason was because, and also the stations and locations, I wanted these women to be as candid as possible. And I knew if they were still working in the industry, they wouldn't feel as though they could be candid and they would be concerned about uh, jeopardizing their employment. And so if we wanted to get a more accurate picture of some of their experiences, I thought that anonymity was really important. So this is how you can reach me. You can go to the website, ladiesleading.net. If you're interested in purchasing the book, you can email tvnews at ladiesleading.net if you have some additional questions. And if you listen to podcasts, you can also uh, go to the podcast. Um, this is a little bit about the birth year of the participants. Um, you can see most of them were born uh, between 1960 and 1969. So some of the women of the 40 that I interviewed were actually gearing up for retirement, especially this, this pie right here, the, those who were born um, in the 1950s, 32%. Um, uh, most of them attended segregated schools and not surprisingly, they had early encounters with racism, especially if they attended segregated schools and lived in segregated communities. Most of them came from two parent households. One of the surprising findings was that uh, many of the women uh, had fathers who had been in the military. And so it makes you wonder if that um, moving around uh, sort of prepared them because uh, one of the women had, um, one of the women who had interviewed, she had moved 12 times for different jobs. And it is pretty typical to move around a lot when you're in the TV news business, but 12, that was, that was pretty high over a 20 year period. So that meant every two years she was moving. And you can imagine how that might've impacted her family life. Um, most of the participants attended PWIs, predominantly white institutions, but about 25% of them attended HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. And it was interesting, um, this was also another interesting finding that most of the women who attended HBC, HBCUs really had uh, an affinity and an affection for their, their alma mater in a way that the students who attended predominantly white institutions did not. Um, and part of the reason was they felt is that at these institutions, they felt seen, they felt heard, they felt as though they didn't have to wear the mask anymore, they felt like they could really be themselves. And so I think that that was also a very important finding. This is where the women worked in terms of the geographical location of the 40 women interviewed. As you can see, 31% from the South, followed by 19% of the Southwest. That was a little surprising, but then Texas, of course, uh, accounted for a lot of that. In the Midwest, only about 18%. Um, again, I was mentioning uh, the number of stations. 
um, and moves again. This number 13 right here had worked at 12 different stations by the time uh, I interviewed her. So again, as I said earlier, that raises lots of questions about how to negotiate your family if you're moving that often, how to, um, you know, if you're moving, you still don't have as much seniority when you do move there. And so you might not be given the best shift, even though you are um, in a supervisory role. A lot of the women said, 65%, that they felt they had to work harder, that uh, sometimes they were assumed to be incompetent just because of their race and gender. And so this is important because as a result of that, many of them also felt like they were passed over promotion, again, the same percentage, because they felt as though they weren't being seen um, as a person who could actually do the job. Many of them considered filing a complaint as a result of that. And then uh, that's more information about their um, economic background growing up uh, as kids. Um, I'll stop there so that I can make sure that, again, we have enough time uh, to, for me to respond to any questions. And then I see Marlene has a hand raised. And uh, so that um, we have about maybe 10 minutes left for questions. So I know we're speaking a little fast there, but you are speaking a little bit uh, fast. Trying to, get, trying to get it in. Um, and I, um, I wanted to ask. Uh, reading the book is great, by the way. Um, I read an electronic copy; otherwise, I would hold it up for you to show you. Uh, but I enjoyed it. I found it uh, illuminating, and. So I'm wondering, you have a full family life, you teach, uh, you advise a lot of students at Northwestern. Um, you wrote a book, you directed a documentary, flying back and forth to South Africa. How did you do it all? Yeah, and I have three children um, as well. Well, I also have a very supportive husband. I wanna throw him out there. Dale uh, Greenwell has been very supportive of me in all of these endeavors. Uh, certainly the travel, we have three children and that meant he had to hold down the fort, you know, when I wasn't here for long periods of time. And I think also um, even, I was telling you before that COVID in some ways has um, given me more time and more space uh, to get these projects done. So, you know, the bulk of sort of the final touches on the documentary and the final touches on the book occurred from February of 2019 through this year. And because there was no place to go on the weekends, um, I was like, well, I might as well do this work and finish it up and, and the podcast. By that time, our children also were adults and out of the house. We just have one who just graduated from Temple University in May of this year. So he too is out on his own. And my husband has been a real source of help for um, all the things that have to go on behind the scenes. So, you know, it's easy. I love being able to tell the story about the documentary and also the book, but there's so many things that had to be done behind the scenes. So, you know, he was helpful. He's a, he's a, has an engineering background. So he was really helpful in, okay, double checking quality assurance, you know, read this a couple more times. Did you see, do you understand this? You know, helping with putting together the website helping to put together um, mailings and things like that. So again, I don't think just like um, Funeka Shashali said about Nelson Mandela, uh, we can't do any of this by ourselves. We have to have help. And when we have help, that also um, makes it doable. And I have to give a shout out also to Northwestern University, my department, the Medill School of Journalism and um, our Dean Charles Whitaker, because um, so prior to him becoming the Dean, the previous Dean Brad Hamm, also was instrumental, um, as, you, as you point out, this is a lot of work, right? And, and it takes a lot of intense focus. You know, it can't be you just do a little bit here and a little bit there. You've got to have some uh, chunk of time carved out. And both Brad Ham and Charles Whitaker were very supportive, um, both financially, and plus I also applied for some grants through Northwestern. I wanna say the Alumni Foundation, the Northwestern Alumni Foundation also uh, awarded me two grants to help pay for this. Um, and then the administrators, the deans also were helpful in giving me some release time. That is some time off here and there to really focus because I wouldn't have been able to do it if I was working full time over the last 10 years and trying to do all of this. So 
again, I just want to give a shout out to those um, those foundations, the university, my husband, friends who were willing to read the manuscript for me. Um, uh, one of my colleagues, Michael Dees, is a fantastic editor. He also was very helpful in, in reading the multiple versions. And so, again, it's just always to important to have people around you, I think, who are willing to support you and willing to help you. Great. I, I'm really glad that you mentioned your husband because I was going to ask um, what the role of a supportive um, spouse plays in this, but I, I'm glad that you Critical. mentioned it. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that um, a lot of the women, uh, a sizable percentage of the women that you interviewed um, had fathers who were in the military. And not only what it made me think that not only are they comfortable moving around, but, um, you know, it's been proven that women who have good relationships with their dads, yeah. supportive, you know, relationships who are uh, they do well in school and in their careers. And um, I, I wonder if that could be. Uh, Absolutely. I, I think that's another thing because remember they're going into positions where they're going to be interacting with a lot of men, particularly a lot of white men, right? Because many of those women were moving, they had integrated, they were the first, you know, to actually be in manager roles. But typically there was somebody else also above them and it tended to be somebody who was male and somebody who was white. And so I think if they had had a positive relationship with their own father, it just made it easier for them to, you know, interact with other men in general, you know, in a professional way, you know, without making them feel, you know, uneasy, not, not, not to say they weren't ever feeling uneasy, but it just made it uh, more palatable, I think, for them. And wasn't the army the first big organization in the United States to be desegregated? Absolutely, executive orders. You know, those executive orders do, um, can be effective, right? And that was one of the ways the military was among some of the first institutions to integrate. Um, and so uh, this is another thing, though in some ways their fathers who were in the military might have been able to move up in rank uh, because of that and Again, as I said, the moving around, I had one um, white male manager who was very supportive and had hired some of these women say, you know, I look for people who've had, uh, have a military background or grew up in a military family to work in journalism. And so sometimes you might think military journalism, you know, how are the two connected? But his philosophy was they're connected because um, number one, they know how to take orders, right? And number two, they move around a lot. So they're not as pressed when it comes to being flexible. The situation's changing. In the news, the situation changes all the time. And so I found that to be um, very interesting as well. Just the role of fathers and uh, dads in general, even for the dads who were not in the military, there's a scene in the book where uh, we talk about um, one woman who was integrating her elementary school and her dad was a teacher. This was, such a, off, this was right? such a great scene. It was, yeah. Yeah, so her dad took off from his classroom and said, I need to take my baby to school today because she's integrating this school for the first time. So she's walking through this line, you know, imagine like your, uh, um, you know, when the National Guard is, is, is coming to Little Rock and the school is being integrated and she's this little second grader and her dad is saying, Look at me, baby. Look at me. Don't don't pay attention to all these people yelling at you, screaming at you, taunting you on the side. And so the fact that that stood out in her mind, and that was an important story that you that she wanted to tell me as part of the research, said to me, these dads, and, and actually most many of the stories about their parents and how supportive their parents were came from the women and their dads, which I thought was interesting. I thought it would have been the other way around, that it would have been their moms but it was really their dads um, who seemed to really have a prominent role in their upbringing. So, um, you know, a lot of the stories of the microaggressions and the, you know, the insults, um, the horrible things that people in management did or said, uh, have, are things getting better as there's more change as there's more diversity, there's more um, awareness training, and as some of the older people are being pushed out, are 
Yeah, I, I, I would hope so, that things are getting better. Remember, I started interviewing these women in 2011. We are now 10 years beyond that. We've had the Me Too movement since that, uh, that time. But that doesn't mean um, things are where they should be. So I'm just gonna read a couple of excerpts. Um, uh, each chapter, I start with a quote from uh, one of the women. And I think I'm just gonna read two because of, of time. So she says, um, uh, this is Cobalt. She's a black woman news manager and she says, because you're a black woman and people are not used to working with you, they doubt everything you said. So in other words, just because of her identity, it made it hard for people to trust that she knew what she was doing. I would hope that she had the skills to actually do the job. I would hope that now as more people get used to seeing black women in supervisory roles, that they now wouldn't be so surprised and they wouldn't just automatically question um, their position and question whether they had the ability uh, to be there. So that's one thing. Um, I think the, the other thing that's really important is how these women mentored. You know, they really, really took mentoring as um, almost like as part of their role, as part of their job. And they mentored in many, many ways, sometimes in secret, sometimes out in the open. Um, but they feel a lot of pressure that when they hire somebody, that that person has to be as good as they are, if not better. And so that was one of those, um, you know, working it twice as hard to get half as far that continued to rear its ugly head throughout the time that many of these women um, took on these roles. Some of these women are now about to retire. And so um, the fact that they feel like, okay, it's okay for me to retire. I think there will be enough people in the pipeline so that I, when I leave, it won't be zero, you know, working in the newsroom. So that to me is a sign of progress as well. And were there some um, extraordinary um, mentors of these women who were not black that stood out? Um, absolutely. I think in some ways, um, you know, some of the mentors that I spoke to were white men and they were mentors to these women. And I think even in the book, you hear them talk about some white women who were allies for them and helped them uh, through the experience. So absolutely, there were um, men, white men, black men, and others who also helped uh, them navigate these spaces. This is my call here. So if, you're, if you don't mind, I'm going to get off now. I really appreciate this opportunity. And again, feel free to reach out to me, folks. And um, hold on, Chanel, I'll get right to you. Um, and I will um, love to hear your responses regarding the book. Great. Okay. Take Thank care. Thank you so much. All right. Bye-bye. Great speaker. So have a great couple of weeks. Stay 